Good morning. Whenever I um, conduct a wedding, I always uh, have a moment in the, the service that I um, surprise the wedding couple with. I, uh, I, I ask them to turn around and just have a look at who's all gathered, uh, because oftentimes they miss that moment, and they are so into the moment in themselves and what's about to happen that uh, they forget to look at who's there. And so I'm just going to take a moment for uh, just to, to look at you, uh, just to know who is here. You are all God's people, and uh, I'm delighted to be with you this morning. Um, I greet you from a, a small but um, a faithful church in Port Perry, and uh, I've met some of you at classes, and uh, uh, I've enjoyed meeting you here, and I'm, I'm just so happy to have this opportunity to, uh, to bring God's Word to you this morning. Um, the title of today's message is Loved, and uh, we are going to be reading from uh, the Bible, Acts chapter 9. I hope that you have brought your own Bible. I always encourage my congregation to do that. Uh, to carry uh, that trusted Bible with you, uh, and then um, as, uh, when we read it together, I think it's a good practice for you to open that Bible, uh, to get used to opening it and, uh, and just get into the habit of, uh, of meeting with God, and as you are looking for the passage, it's almost like preparation in, in meeting God Himself. Uh, it might be a, a bit intimidating, chapter 9, uh, 31 verses. Um, we're going to read up to verse 20 in the service, but uh, some of what I say will cover the entire chapter. It is the chapter on Saul's conversion, and uh, we will consider that uh, this morning. I just need to situate myself here just a little bit. Just be patient. Before we actually read God's Word, uh, I just would like one more moment just to bow our hearts uh, so that uh, we are in that right spirit and that the Spirit is in us. So let us pray. Father, Your Word is precious. Your Word is life. And Your Word also is a double-edged sword. Even as we sit uh, here to dissect your word, uh, it also dissects us, Father. It looks into our hearts, into our being. But let us not be afraid of that because you are the God who loves us. Speak to us this morning. Speak to us. And may we be different. May we live differently as a result of hearing your word this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts chapter 9. Uh, like I said, really we are covering uh, up to verse 31, uh, but I'm going to uh, stop at verse 20. This is the Word of God. Meanwhile... Saul was still breathing out murderous, murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground. And he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up, and go into that city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. 
The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm that he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, whom appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus, and at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the Word of God. I think we know the story. I think we've heard it before, perhaps. Perhaps you've heard a sermon preached on it in your lifetime or a, a few. Saul's conversion. Saul, who, who becomes Paul, and Paul, of course, that great missionary who established many churches at the beginning, uh, uh, shortly after uh, Jesus uh, returned to heaven. The birth of the church uh, is almost unimaginable, un unimaginable without considering Paul. And as we have read an entire chapter almost, it is easy to overlook the way that the chapter uh, starts. This, the chapter starts with that one word that is so easily overlooked. Meanwhile. Meanwhile is a word that ties this story to another story. There was something else happening before uh, this dramatic story of Saul's conversion. And, and we need to connect to that story in order to uh, be able to uh, understand fully what is happening in this story. The story that comes just before this is the story of Philip and the Ethiopian, and maybe you've heard that story as well. There was this Ethiopian official that was in this chariot, a high official, an important man, and he was reading from a scroll, but he did not understand what he was reading, and, 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 and a disciple of Jesus named Philip was in the area, and he heard the voice of God, he heard the prompting of the Spirit uh, tell him to go. And go to that chariot and walk close to it. And just at the, just the right moment, uh, he was able to, to speak into the questions that this Ethiopian official had. And of course, he leads this Ethiopian uh, official to an understanding of, of the God of life. And he is converted, he is baptized, and he becomes also a follower of the way, Philip who was so sensitive uh, to the uh, prompting of the Holy Spirit uh, that he was right there at the right time and God was able to use him to bring this Ethiopian official to Christ. And if you look back even further, uh, chapter 8, uh, 4 through 8, we see what kind of man uh, Philip was. Listen to uh, the verses 4 through 8, describing Philip, this disciple. 
Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. And when the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs that he performed, and saw, uh, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out from many. Many who were paralyzed or, uh, or lame were healed. And so there was great joy in that city. This is the description of Philip. Philip, a, a faithful disciple of Christ, in tune with the Holy Spirit. That is the story that is being told. And then, and only then, do we come upon this story, the conversion of Saul. Meanwhile, so keep this story in the back of your mind. Meanwhile, something else was happening. Meanwhile, we have a guy named Saul. So the attention turns from this spirit-filled Philip in tune with God's voice to Saul, who was instead uttering murderous threats. Saul was hunting, hunting for Jesus followers. Hunting, hunting for those people who, who are now uh, claiming to be part of the way. They were, they were following this rebel upstart preacher named Jesus. And Saul was going to deal with anyone who dared to attach themselves to this guy. He went hunting. He went looking for prisoners. He even got official papers, he, he, he got official documents that he would be able to arrest them, throw them in jail, deal with this uprising that he claimed was happening against the authorities. Saul had rage in his eyes. He was going to deal with these people. And then everything changes. From heaven uh, comes this voice, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He is stopped dead in his tracks by a voice from heaven. And then his response. Who, who, who are you, Lord? He was totally astounded. He was on his knees. Something like this had never happened to him before. And then the voice appeared again. I am Jesus. Now get up and go. I dare say that when most of us hear that voice, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? I dare say that most of us hear it as the voice of judgment. And in a sense, we are happy internally. We say, yes, God is going to deal with Saul. God is going to deal with, with, with those who, who, who chase down Christians, who stand in the way of Christians and, and in the way of Jesus. Our God is a powerful God. We sang about the Lion of Judah, and we can imagine God sweeping in and, and, and cuffing Saul at the side of his head and dealing with him, uh, swatting him away as if he's a, nothing more than a fly. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Yet I think that's a mistake. I think when we hear the voice as a voice of judgment, 
I think we need to, to stop and pause. It's a mistake that we often make as humans. How many times has something happened to you and you, and you have that quiet voice in the back of your head asking if, if, if God is punishing you? Have I done something wrong? Why is this happening to me? God must not be pleased with me. God must be angry with me. And, and, and you look back over, over your week and you say, what is happening? God is not pleased. Even insurance companies have, have perpetuated this false view of God. When something bad happens, you know you have that clause in your, in your insurance. Then, sorry, you have been a victim of an act of God. Oftentimes, and many people have a view of God as a God of judgment, as an angry God, as a God of, an old, uh, of the Old Testament, the God who strikes down and, and, and in a way that we, that we don't always understand. But there is only one other time that a voice came from heaven. in the same way as it did to Saul. Do you know when that is? There was a time at Jesus' baptism when Jesus uh, submitted to John the Baptist to be baptized so that all uh, decrees should be fulfilled, that he might be seen as righteous. As he, as he, as he comes out of the wa waters, we also hear uh, this voice as, as heaven breaks open, and the voice says, This is my son, whom I love. What if we were to hear the voice of God to Saul, not as the voice of an angry, judgmental God, but as the God of love. What if we were to connect this event, the voice from heaven, heaven breaking open, to the baptism of Jesus Christ? Heaven broke open and that voice booms, this is my son whom I love. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? I am Jesus. Now get up and go. And these words were authoritative somehow. We're not sure, but it is clear to everyone that was with Saul at this time that there was an authority in this voice from heaven, and it left everybody without a doubt that these were words uh, to be uh, followed. These were commands uh, that were not optional, but these were words of life. We see that uh, the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. It leaves no doubt. Something clearly had happened. This was not Saul hallucinating. This was not Saul on cheap drugs. Something of significance had definitely happened here. We know that also uh, from verse 9. For three days, Saul was blind. He did not eat or drink. Now, I can't help but make another connection. Three days in darkness. Does it remind you of another story? 
And after three days in darkness, life. A return to full living. Even Jesus Christ himself. Resurrection. And it raises the objections of Ananias. Ananias receives a vision as well. He's in a completely different area. He receives a vision. He receives the command of God. Now go. <laughs> Ananias, uh, Ananias was delighted to be able to go, wasn't he? Uh, when, when he heard the command of God, when he heard the instruction of God to him to, to, to tell him what he must do, he said, are you kidding me? Do you know who this is? Saul. I hear that this man has been going around persecuting your people. He's been imprisoning them. He's been beating them. He's been murdering them. And you want me to go to him? <laughs> Lord, really? You better check your notes. I think you, you may be uh, one of the pages, maybe in a different place, in the wrong place. Check your book of life. I, 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 I'm not going. I can't do that. But the Lord is insistent. This is the man I have chosen. This is the man I have chosen. He is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles, and not only to the Gentiles, to their kings and to the people of Israel. It is he. It is Saul. And so, needless to say, Ananias goes. And he lays his hand on this persecutor of Christians. He, he lays his hands on, on, on those who, 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 were, who was terrifying Christians. And immediately, he turns to God. He is baptized. He is filled with the Spirit as, as who was? As Philip. Remember Philip, the, the story just before that? Philip, the, the man whom God used and, and used greatly to reach even the Ethiopian eunuch, the, the great uh, officials who was in tune with the Spirit of God. Now that Spirit of God is put inside murderous, raging Saul who becomes Paul, the greatest missionary evangelist and church planter that we know who then is changed, who is transformed, who is so in tune with God that he steps fully into the mission of God. This is my son, whom I love. Have you ever looked at someone in church and wondered if they belonged? If they really ought to be there, uh, did you have, did you hold uh, back some tidbit, some fact that others didn't know when you were tempted, uh, and yet you know it's wrong to gossip, but if people know, maybe I should tell an elder, maybe I should tell the pastor, maybe this, this is not right. And I've asked him to be a greeter at the door. Really? And what happens after this, after Saul meets the God who loves him, he experiences grace upon grace. Verses 17 through 31, we see moment after moment, event after event, blessing after blessing that falls upon Saul, who is now forever going to be known as Paul. In verse 17, 
We see that he, 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 was, he could see again. His sight was restored, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. In verse 18, he got up, he, he was baptized, he regained his strength. Verse 21, all who heard him were astonished. He spoke with the same kind of authority <laughs> that brought him to his knees on the road. Verse 22, he grew in proving Jesus to the Jews. He, he went into the synagogues, the synagogues that maybe he had previously gone and hauled people out to arrest them, to throw them in jail, to beat them, to martyr them. Now he went into those synagogues and he preached Christ, the living God. Verse 28 he, we see that he moved freely and he spoke boldly. Nothing could stop Paul. With the same uh, uh, motivation and with the same intention and with the same energy that he used to persecute and beat down the, uh, the followers of Jesus, he, he now spoke of the great love of God. And he was, without even saying anything, he, he was almost like a living testimony of, of, of the power of God. If God can do this, then surely he can do this for me. And that is the point. In verse 31, we read that the church enjoyed peace and was strengthened. People of God, never underestimate what God does in your life, how it affects your church community. You say, well, who am I after all? <laughs> I am only one, and I have nothing to offer to God. You are my child, whom I love. And you are my chosen instrument. As you as a church stand at the cusp, as you are seeking God. See, you are already much ahead of Saul who wasn't even seeking God. He was raging against God. You as a church are, are entering into a time of prayer, into a time of seeking. Please support your leaders. Please join the prayer meetings. Please become part of this. Seek Him and expect to hear the voice of God. Expect heaven to open up once again. And expect that message to resound again and to resound still. Maranatha, you are my people. You are the people that I love. And you are my chosen instrument. I have a note in my office. It appeared one Thursday morning. Let me show it to you. I can't see it very well. I'm going to turn this way. I, I, I'm getting so old that I, I can't see that anymore. I'm sorry. Here's the note that I found in my office on my desk. It said, you are amazing. You are important. You are special. You are unique. You are kind, you are precious, and most importantly, you are loved, period. The gems had left that note in my office, and that note is now prominently on one of my, uh, just above my desk, and it reminds me constantly of the great love of God. It is my voice from heaven. Maranatha, we can be a people of hope because God loves us deeply. Do you believe this? Whatever you have done, 
Whatever road you have walked, whatever words you have uttered, whatever awful things you have done, don't let it prevent you from coming to the table of the Lord. I still meet people in the Christian Reformed especially, uh, Church especially who, who, who refuse to come to the communion table because they say, oh, I, I'm, I'm a sinner. There is no sin that you can commit that the love, the great love, the awesome God cannot wipe away. And it's not just old Christian Reformed people that struggle with this. We have new generations that are seeking love, that are seeking self-worth, that are seeking this from social media. How many likes? How many friends? How many people have checked out my pages first thing in the morning, last thing before going to sleep? They are searching. They are desperate for love. Hear the voice from heaven. You are my child. I made you in my own image. Male and female, boys and girls, young and old, wretched and perfect. I don't know which one you, you, which one of those you fit. And it doesn't matter which one of those you fit because all of you, the message is the same. You're my child, and I love you. Step into my love, walk into my arms, into my embrace, and you too, like so, will experience grace upon grace in your life, into a life that never ends. God is good. He's a good, good father, and I'm loved by him. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, if you can take a man like Saul, if you can take a persecutor, if you can take uh, someone who, who, who tr- sought to destroy your church, and turn and embrace him with your love, then surely you can love me. Thank you for your great love. Love me, I pray. Love us as a church and instill in us as a church that love for our community that we may go out and speak of good news. We have a good, good Father, and He loves you. Amen.